Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 8220 in the name of Keith Brown on bail and release from custody, Scotland bill at stage one. I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and to move the motion. Uh, around nine minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to open this debate on the general principles of the Bail and Release from Custody Scotland Bill, and I would want to give my thanks to the Criminal Justice Committee for their scrutiny of the Bill and to all those who gave evidence. The Committee's report raised a number of important points which I have addressed in my written response to them, but at the heart of this Bill is the aim to reduce crime, reduce reoffending, and to make Scotland safer. The Bill will do this by focusing on two critical points of the justice system – the point at which bail decisions are first made by the court and the point at which people are released from prison. The Bill addresses long-standing concerns about the use of remand in Scotland. Of course, the use of remand can be necessary, and I am clear that it plays an essential part in protecting victims and the wider public, and the Bill does not change that. But we also know that remand itself can be damaging for individuals who do not pose a risk to public safety or are a clear risk to the administration of justice, there is and there must be a better approach. The reforms to bail law recognise the negative impact of short periods of imprisonment while ensuring public and victim safety centre in decision making. And this will mean people are only remanded in custody as a last resort if they pose a risk to public safety, victim safety or, in certain cases, the delivery of justice. The Bill also includes reforms which will better enable reintegration after a period in custody by improving pre-release activity and through care support. Uh, Presiding officer, I encourage members to support the Bill for the following reasons. First of all, on use of remand. While prison is obviously necessary for those who pose a risk of public safety, remand removes people from their homes, families, jobs and communities. And we must remember these are people who have at that time not been convicted of any crime, or at least of the crime they have been accused of. As well as damaging those connections, short periods of imprisonment, including on remand, do not address the underlying causes of offending or support rehabilitation. As Professor Fergus McNeill put it, short periods of imprisonment are not a magic box that removes or eliminates risks and keeps us safe, but actually more likely to serve as an incubator of risk. It should therefore be a concern to us all that the number of people held on remand remains at historic highs. On the 1st of February, 29% of the total prison population, 2,150 people were held on remand. And this is this I will do, yes. Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary Gouin. He is quite right. But th that proportion is not just high historically, it is very high in comparison to other countries. And so he is right about that we need to look at the underlying causes of why people end up in prison. But we not also need to look at the underlying reasons and causes why Scotland uses uh, remand to, to such high levels, especially by international comparison. Cabinet Secretary. The, the member is absolutely right. And I have made the same point a number of times, including to the committee. Why is it higher in Scotland? What is there that is going on that has us? with these much higher figures, and the Bill seeks to address that, and I will come on to explain that uh, more fully, but I entirely agree uh, with the Member. What is the reason why Scotland sends so many more people uh, uh, to, to remand uh, rather than other jurisdictions? Although I have to say, more recently in the UK, it is now approaching the levels that we have here in Scotland, but that is relatively recent. So what lies at the heart of the bail reforms is an absolute commitment to public safety and victim safety, and the bail proposals will enhance the role of justice social work so they have more opportunity to inform the courts uh, on bail decision-making. And that will make consistent the already good practice which is happening just now. It will also help the courts to have the right information at the right time. And it has been suggested that the enhanced role of justice social work could result in people being remanded for longer than they would be at present. But that is not the case. And just to be clear, firstly, the Bill does not change the timescales under which the bail decision must be made, which is approximately a period of 20 hours, 24 hours rather, from the time the person is first brought before the court. And secondly, the court is not required to have information from Justice Social Work to make the initial bail decision under the bill. As now, where there is no information available from Justice Social Work, the court will simply make its bail decision on the basis of the information it does have from the Crown and Defence. 
And thirdly, beyond the existing 24-hour window uh, for a bail decision to be made, the court cannot choose to refuse bail and remand a person in custody simply because Justice Social Work have indicated they, they need more time to provide information. And this is because there is an overarching legal presumption for bail, which the bill does not change. So unless there's already a good reason to refuse bail, in which case the person would be remanded anyway under the current system, then the person must be admitted to bail and allowed to stay in the community. The seriousness of the decision to use remand is emphasised by requiring the court to record the grounds upon which bail is refused. The bill is supported by continued investment in community justice, including alternatives to remand. In 2023-24, we will invest a total of £134 million in community justice services. And the bail aspects of this bill seek to answer important questions about the appropriate use of remand in a modern and progressive Scotland, now and in the future. Presenting officer, I now to turn to part two of the bill, which is focused on improving support for people leaving prison. We know that many people who are in contact with the justice system have already experienced severe and multiple disadvantage, including homelessness, uh, homelessness, substance misuse and mental ill health. And that's especially true of the prison population. Imprisonment often compounds these issues, which is why holistic, well-planned support on release is so important. And part two of the bill aims to do that in a number of ways. Firstly, the bill ends scheduled releases from prison on a Friday or the day before a public holiday. And that responds to calls from, amongst others, the Drugs-Related Deaths Task Force, but also other ex experts that the day people are released matters. As several witnesses to the committee made clear, planning for an individual's release from prison should start from the point of entry. The proposed pre-release planning duty in the bill is based on that principle. And it will require wider public services to engage in pre-release planning at an earlier point, with the aim that people leave prison with a package of support, not a list of appointments. The bill also establishes a new duty on Scottish ministers to publish statutory minimum standards for through care support for remand and for sentenced prisoners. We know that good practice exists, and I've seen the difference through care support can make, but it is not consistent, and the bill seeks to address that. Additionally, access to structured and monitored temporary release can help to support an individual's reintegration and reduce their risk of reoffending. And that's why we're introducing a new temporary release license for certain long-term prisoners with an emphasis on risk assessment and robust community monitoring and support. And the bill also introduces, uh, introduces a wider emergency prisoner release power with built-in safeguards to protect the security of prisons and the safety of prisoners and staff. Now, we'd hope never to use that power, but the pandemic has taught us, as in other administrations, not to be complacent on that score. And this brings us into line with jurisdictions, including England and Wales. As I've made clear, the bill has victim safety at its heart. The new bail test explicitly recognises the safety of victims for the first time. And not only that, but the bill defines safety as safety from both physical and psychological harm. And this recognises our much better understanding of the harm caused by threatening or coercive behaviour. Additionally, victims will now be able to nominate a victim support organisation to receive information regarding the release of a prisoner in their case with them or on their behalf. So, President Officer, I would say to members, I would welcome, genuinely welcome, and I've said this right the way through the process so far, all constructive challenge and suggestions to make this bill more effective. We all took part, or most of us here took part, in a debate some 18 months or so ago when we discussed and agreed that the remand levels were too high in Scotland and agreed that something has to be done. If others have suggestions as to what can be done, then I'm more than willing to listen to them, as I have been. And at this stage, all we're doing, in addition to what I've laid out, is setting out the general principles. I would hope that we would get support, at least for the general principles, which follow on from that consensus that we had previously in terms of remand being too high. But in providing that challenge, I would ask uh, everyone else to consider if they have an alternative proposal to address the use of remand, to safeguard victims or to improve support for people leaving prison. And if they do that, then I am more than willing to listen and take on board those comments. The provisions within the bill are underpinned by a commitment to public protection and victim safety, with a focus on reducing crime, reoffending, and future victimisation. And that is what will make Scotland a safer place. So I move that the, general, uh, the Parliament agree to the general principles of the bail and release from custody Scotland bill. Thank you.
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Audrey Nicholl to speak on behalf of the Criminal Justice Committee. Around eight minutes, please, Ms Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I am very pleased to open the Stage 1 debate on behalf of the Criminal Justice Committee on the Bail and Release from Custody Scotland Bill. I want to thank the committee clerks, spy staff and our committee adviser Mr Chris Miller for their support throughout Stage 1 and I thank the Scottish Government for their detailed response to our Stage 1 report. The committee gave very detailed consideration to the proposals in the Bill. Uh, we received a substantial amount of written and oral evidence, and we took, also took uh, the time to engage more widely with those affected by bail and release issues. We held extremely valuable sessions with survivors of serious crime to hear their experiences of bail and, where relevant, release from prison. And we also visited organisations that support prisoners on release to hear about the challenges that they and their families face when leaving prison. And we visited Glasgow Sheriff Court to observe a typical busy Monday afternoon custody court. And all this evidence helped inform our views on the bill. And I would like to welcome Fiona Fordry and Nicola Caldwell of the Graf Project uh, to Parliament this afternoon uh, and thank them for hosting members uh, during an extremely informative visit to their project in Kilmarnock. Some members of the committee felt unable to support the general principles of the bill due to concerns about its overall purpose, impact and issues around resourcing. However, all members agreed that it contained some useful provisions. And the conclusions and recommendations in our Stage 1 report were agreed without division. Committee members will set out their own views on specific areas of the Bill during today's debate. However, I will highlight some of the main findings, certainly not all of them, outlined in our Stage 1 report. Section 1 of the Bill requires a court to give Justice Social Work the opportunity to provide relevant information when bill, bail is being considered. We welcome this new requirement in principle. Justice Social Work has a valuable role to play in informing court decisions. However, the committee had concerns that if Justice Social Work is not properly resourced to carry out this enhanced role, there is a risk that the policy objectives of the Bill may not be achieved and that, in fact, we unintentionally introduce delays in the court system. In the response, the Scottish Government agrees resourcing an enhanced role for social work will be challenging and provides an assurance that it will engage closely with Social Work Scotland and COSLA on this matter. Section 2 of the Bill changes the grounds upon which a court may decide to refuse bail. This means that bail would only be refused if an accused is considered to pose a risk to public safety or where there is a significant risk of prejudice to the interests of justice. We heard different views about the impact of changes to the bail test. Some witnesses were unclear if this will be a minor reframing of the rules or a more fundamental reform. There were also concerns expressed about what is meant by public safety, which is a key part of the new bail test. But we did not think that the bill fully addressed the concerns expressed by the senior judiciary that the outcomes of bail decisions might not, in fact, be changed by the new bail test. Some committee members felt it would be preferable if the factors that judges take into account in taking bail decisions were included on the face of the bill. And in its response, the government notes the range of views expressed on the new bail test and highlights that it seeks to combine a requirement for the court to use its judgment to determine the risk of an adverse event happening, for example, offending on bail, with the likely impact of such an event. 
One of the more difficult issues some members grappled with was the proposal to repeal Section 23D of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act of 1995. This currently restricts the granting of bail in certain areas, notably where an individual is accused of a violent, sexual or domestic abuse offence or drug trafficking and has a previous conviction under Solon Procedure for such an offence. The Scottish Government argues that repealing Section 23D would simplify the legal framework on bail and aid the decision-making of the Court. Our main focus was to satisfy ourselves that the, that the repeal of Section 23D would not lead to adverse effects on the safety of victims. This has been a major concern of organisations rep representing the victims of crime. On the other hand, many other organisations argued that removal of Section 23D was reasonable and would not impact the way courts consider victim safety. Some members of the, of the committee were persuaded that the necessary safeguards will be in place if Section 23D is repealed. Others were not. In their response, the Scottish Government provides an assurance that it will continue engagement with victims' groups regarding the repeal of Section 23D and how the new bail test has public safety and victim safety at the heart of how it operates. On part two of the bill, we welcomed the provisions on personal release plans for prisoners and minimum standards applying to through care support for prisoners. They will provide an extra focus and structure to the arrangements for supporting prisoners on release. The committee hopes that they will help avoid the sorts of gaps in the provision of support which we heard about. However, the committee also made the point that the policy objective of reducing offending and supporting reintegration into the community will be undermined unless the required resources are made available. The bill allows information about a prisoner's release that can already be given to a victim of that prisoner to be given to a victim support organisation. This was welcomed in principle, however, some victim organisations raised concerns about information being shared without the consent of the victim. We are pleased that the Scottish Government is willing to discuss these concerns further. The committee also heard evidence directly from the survivors of crime about the deficiencies with current victim engagement in the justice system. And the committee asked the Scottish Government to consider what further information can be provided to victims to give them confidence that bail conditions are effectively supervised. So in conclusion, presiding officer, there are differences of views on the bill amongst committee members. However, there is also agreement from all members that it contains some useful provisions, some of which I have highlighted this afternoon. If Parliament agrees to the general principles today, we stand ready to scrutinise the bill at stage two. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Nicholl. I now call on Jamie Green. Around eight minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I am pleased to be opening the bail and release from custody bill. I'd like to thank my committee colleagues, our clerks, advisers and the many witnesses who came to give evidence to us during the creation of this, uh, what I thought was a forensic report. Every member of the committee played their part constructively in its creation, as the convener rightly pointed out. So much so that it wasn't actually until we got to the last paragraph of the last page of this 50-page report did we actually agree to disagree. And even then, our disagreement was complicated, to say the least. Indeed, uh, the Labour benches couldn't even agree amongst themselves a position on the final position. I think such was the nuances of personal opinion and what we had heard as a committee. I think this report was one of compromise, uh, one of collective agreement, and it was in depth. The government's response to our report, however, is another matter. The bill follows a pattern of legislation that I have seen far too frequently in this place. It mingles policies which are good, bad and indifferent and forces us into a binary choice to either support all or none of it. And that's a choice made more difficult by the bill's two very distinct parts. The first, clearly seeking to make substantive changes to the judicial rules or whether someone uh, who is accused of a crime is either uh, remanded into custody 
or freed on bail, which is where I think some of the unease in the bill might lie. And the second, which makes changes as to when and how prisoners can be released, because we all know the tragic consequences of what happens when that goes wrong. Uh, another proposal in part two will offer more information to victims about prisoner release, for example. And whilst that is all very welcome, it does not go far enough in our review because victims are too often the last to learn about decisions of this nature. And as is too often this case, in this parliament and from this government, the bill buries the contro controversial amongst the quite well-meaning. The bill, as we took evidence, clearly divided opinion. It created, in my view, more questions than answers. I think it confused many witnesses. Indeed, it confused committee members. And those witnesses largely fell into one of three camps, in my view. The first, uh, mostly, I would say, academic friends of the government, to use a phrase, who largely supported the bill in its full. The second were the victims of crime and those who support victims of crime, who I think had quite mixed feelings about the bill. And we see that from the papers they've sent us even as recently as today. And the third group, and the one that intrigued me the most, was those who were warning that interfering with the judiciary in this manner will prove to either be meaningless or is unduly tinkering with the independence of the judiciary itself. And I think our report echoes all of that because they are right, presiding officer, it is unclear what exactly the government's objective really is with this bill. Because they go to great lengths to say that the bill is absolutely not about clearing out our prisons, nor is it about tying the hands of judges. Yet in the response to our report, it is stated clearly in black and white that, I quote, the overarching aim of the provisions is to refocus how custody is used. Let's think about that word, refocus. It's an interesting choice of word to use. Because this whole bill seems to be based on the, in my view, untested assumption that a remand population is too high due to overuse of remand and not overpopulation due to the backlog. The committee was highly critical, I think, about the lack of data available to us, which underpins the government's position and presumption on this. Because if we do have an unusually high remand population, then the question must be asked, why is that so? And is this bill necessary to fix the root cause of it? I think simple questions remain unanswered at this stage. We know there are untried prisoners backlogged in the system that are clearly driving the remand population numbers. And a demonstrable shift in the nature of crime patterns and the nature of the offences coming through our courts also plays an important factor. The Law Society of Scotland itself acknowledges that the accused are only remanded into custody because of the seriousness of the offence and the significant risk to the complainer or to the public, and rightly so. Uh, I'm happy to give way if I get my time back. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to Jamie Green uh, for giving way. It, it's a bit of an echo of what Daniel Johnson um, intervened the Cabinet Secretary on earlier on. I, I absolutely understand, because I, I was on the Je Justice Committee in the last session where we undertook um, a, a, an, invest an inquiry on, on remand and getting to the, the granularity, the detail of why the remand population was so high was escaped us as well. But I think it also points to the fact that this isn't just a, a reflection of the backlog that we've seen build up in, in recent years. Jamie Green. It's not just a reflection, but it's been exacerbated by the reflection. And what I'm going to come on to in a second is to question what underpins the government's approach in this specific bill. Um, I think what we have seen, certainly as a result of legislation that we've passed in here, DASA, for example, and also a raft of historical sexual allegations which are now coming to light and are now seeing their day in court, coupled with other decisions made by the government, including the presumption against, against short sentences, what we are seeing is clearly a changing profile of those who are being remanded into custody. And that's the, that's the thing. I think that the proposed changes in this bill will deal with none of those, actually. I think we can only be led to the conclusion that the government takes a view that judges and sheriffs are either making the wrong decisions on remand or the rules which govern those decisions are wrong. One of those must be true, otherwise they would not have taken the approach that they did. I really I don't have time, but perhaps uh, you can comment on summing up. Because whichever way it is spun, uh, presiding officer, this bill does narrow the parameters by which bail can be granted. And I think that is why there is opposition to it. We've heard unusual but really stark criticism of the government's approach from the judiciary itself over this. The Crown, in evidence, argued that inconsistency on the application of the new public safety test would lead to, I quote, confusion and ultimately inefficiency. 
The Faculty of Advocates told us that if it is intended to be a change, then it should be more overt. But if it is not intended to be a change to the test, then it's all pointless. The Cabinet Secretary, Cabinet Secretary responded to concerns over the definition of the public safety test in his response by simply spelling out the dictionary definition of the words. So here's my challenge to the Cabinet Secretary and to the SNP on this. Tell us what you really mean by refocus how custody is used. What truth and what intent lies behind the jargon? Because we don't know. The government is adamant that remanding a person into custody should be the last resort. I agree. But isn't that already the case? Indeed, I saw it with my own two eyes in a busy custody court one grim Monday morning in Glasgow. And presumably, therefore, Lord Carloway will need correcting by ministers over his learned view that the bill will introduce an unnecessary, cumbersome and artificial process without changing outcomes and bail decision making. In other words, he is saying, what's the point? Is this tinkering for tinkering's sake? And it's ironic that we are, we are assured by ministers that at the heart of the new bail test lies, in their own words, a commitment to public safety and a reduction in offending. Admirable. But how can you marry that up with the fact that one in four convicted crimes in Scotland in the year 20 to 21 were convicted by someone on bail? That's 15,000 offences, and sadly, seven people lost their lives as a result. I think only in some parallel universe can you come to the conclusion that by releasing more people on bail, you can cut crime, you can reduce reoffending, you can improve public safety, and more importantly, improve victim confidence in the justice system. It's no real surprise that the very people who support victims of crime have been so vocal about this. And I refer to Scottish Women's Aid and Victim Support Scotland, who reiterate their deep unease about the narrowing of the court's decision making to refuse bail. They said that it risks the safety of victims of crime, particularly women, children and young people, far from protecting victims. It will allow bail to be granted to repeat and serial abusers of domestic abuse. Now, the government's response to that was, we note the comments. Cabinet Secretary, maybe it's about time the government did less noting and more listening. I'm going to close where I started. Our stage one report, I think, was balanced, it was fair, and it was punchy. It's how proper scrutiny should be done in this place. But when it comes to tinkering with laws which protect public safety, we are minded to err on the side of caution and the side of victims, because any legislation which compromises confidence or trust in the justice system, I cannot support that. If the victims of abuse and violence are not convinced, then nor am I. If the judiciary is not convinced, then nor am I. So as drafted, I'm afraid, and for these reasons, we cannot support the general principles of this bill. Thank you, Mr Green. I now call on Katie Clark. Uh, around six minutes, please, Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to open this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour. As the Cabinet Secretary has said, the backdrop is that Scotland has the highest remand figures and highest prison population in Western Europe, and has indeed had that for many decades. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary said, um, the current remand rate is in the region of 29% of the prison population. But the figure for women is higher, um, and the most recent statistic we had was that 36 of women in prison um, currently are on remand. Historically, Scottish people were proud of our Scottish criminal justice system, and in particular the protections provided by strict time limits and how long the state could hold an accused person in custody and before trial. Those time limits have been extended on more than one occasion since the creation of the Scottish Parliament most recently last year. And that may be one of the factors that has led to Scotland continuing to have high remand rates. In 2007, the Scottish um, Prisons Commission recommended a target of reducing Scotland's prison population to 5,000. However, the prison population in Scotland has not been below 7,000 since then. Many of the points made in that Commission report are very similar to the reports um, that are provided today at stage one um, to this chamber, because that report um, stated that remand was often used as a result of lack of information or lack of services in the community to support people on bail. Scottish Labour believes that that can only be addressed, not by legislation, but by addressing 
focused additional funding for court social work and to those leaving prison. The backdrop is that justice and council budgets are being cut and the social work justice services in the courts have been reduced over many, many years. As Audrey Nicholl has said, the committee expressed concern about a lack of data about who is being remanded. Scottish Labour believes that that data is necessary to create evidence-based law. We accept we have a long-term challenge, but we believe that this bill presents a significant missed opportunity. It proposes a number of changes to bail law, but what is not clear is whether the bill will increase or reduce the remand population. It is not clear whether those who are charged with violent offences will be more or less likely to be granted bail, and indeed it is not clear whether those accused of non-violent offences are more likely or less likely to, be draft, to receive bail. Um, it may be that more people charged with violent offences will be remanded as a result of this legislation is passed, and indeed it may be that less people who are charged with non-violent offences um, would be remanded, but that's not clear um, due to the lack of clarity in the drafting of the bill. Both defence and prosecution lawyers have said that they were not clear how the public safety test would be interpreted by the court, and we believe that the most likely outcome um, is that this legislation would make no difference in most cases, but would lead to more appeals until the law is settled. And we do not believe that is in the interests of justice. So we call on the Scottish Government to outline clearly to the Scottish Parliament and indeed to the courts what it is trying to achieve and the factors they wish the courts to consider when considering public safety. This bill does, however, lower the threshold to remand those who fail to turn up at court, and that will make it more likely that accused people will obtain bail in circumstances where they currently are remanded, where there is a history of failing to turn up. We believe that the implications and indeed the costs to the, the justice system involved in apprehending accused to, to appear in court um, to um, be taken through the justice system need to be properly scrutinised and we do not believe as a committee that we had the opportunity to do that. Um, as has been said by um, Jamie Green, in his response to the Scottish Government on behalf of the judiciary, the most senior uh, law, uh, judge in Scotland, Lord Carraway, said that the bill introduced a cumbersome and artificial process, more bureaucracy, and says it is difficult to see how the proposed structure will make any practical difference to outcomes. However, we also know that women's organisations like Scottish Women's Aid and Victim Support Scotland are making submissions saying that they believe that the bill narrows the court's discre discretion and that the safety of victims of crime, particularly women, children and young people experiencing domestic abuse, are put at risk. As we heard from Audrey Nicholl, we've heard conflicting evidence on the proposal to repeal Section 23D of the 1995 Act, and we're not clear that the repeal will make any significant difference in many cases. We know that Scotland has proportionately one of the highest prison populations in Europe. I think we're second. Um, we also believe that more women are being charged with violent offences. However, almost 40% of convicted women prisoners are still not imprisoned for, are, are still imprisoned for non-violent offences. And it's not clear whether this bill will enable women to get bail more easily. Scottish Labour believes that custody is rarely the correct disposable for women facing criminal charge, charges, but there continues to be a lack of effective and credible alternatives provided to the courts. We believe that without providing the funding and resource required and addressing the concerns being raised by the judiciary, there's a serious danger that this bill will simply only add more bureaucracy. We believe that this is a missed opportunity and we ask the Scottish Government to address the concerns that are being raised by the judges, by legal practitioners and indeed by those representing victim complainers and substantially redraft this bill. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Clark. And I now call on Liam MacArthur. Around six minutes, please, Mr. MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I start with an, uh, an apology that I will have to leave the debate uh, early in order to uh, fly home for the uh, Orkney Youth Awards? Um, I'm, I'm not anticipating picking up an award, um, but nevertheless, very much looking forward to attending. Can I um, also congratulate Audrey Nicholl and her colleagues on the Criminal Justice Committee on the report. Um, I, I did not sit through the, the evidence, but I have had an opportunity to read the report uh, and indeed uh, a number of the submissions. I am very grateful to those who circulated uh, briefings uh, as well. But I think, like Katie Clark and the Cabinet Secretary, I would want to start by setting a degree of, of, of context here. Scotland's prison population is far too high. It has been far too high for some time. We lock up more of our population, I think, um, uh, than anywhere else other than uh, Turkey and Russia uh, in Europe. Um, and overcrowding um, has its own um, effects. Uh, certainly it was the case uh, during the course of the last session, pretty much throughout it, that our prisons, every single one of our prisons, uh, bar maybe one or two, were overcrowding. Double bunking was the norm. Um, and the effects of that were to add risks to prisoners themselves, um, add risks to prison staff, and I would argue add risk to communities as well when those prisoners were, as they would inevitably be in almost every instance, uh, released back into those communities. And I well remember um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary's predecessor, Hamza Youssef, uh, convening a meeting of uh, justice spokespeople in the last session at a point where it was pretty clear that the numbers in our male prisons were about to top 8,000 um, a, a, a record at that point. And while um, I think we all had our own political differences, there was a shared, I think, understanding about the imperative uh, to, to, to take action to bring down uh, that prison population. And in fact, I think prison reform um, is long overdue, and, and the aspect of the justice brief that has been given probably um, the least attention over the, uh, the duration of devolution. I mean, I was struck very much by um, what I thought was an excellent uh, briefing from Spice, as they uh, always are, um, which pointed to the, the, to the fact that those in our prison population over the last 20 years that have been sentenced have remained broadly the same. It's gone up and, and more recently, both for the male and female um, prisoner population, then gone down. Uh, but those on remand um, uh, now constitutes a significantly higher proportion both of the male and female prison population. I think it doubled in both instances, representing about a third of the prison population in male um, prisons, and as uh, Katie Clark reminded us, um, well over a third of the female prison population. And, and, and that, I think, is, is alarming. I think Jamie Green's right to point to the effect that certainly COVID has had and the, and the backlog has had. But this, um, let's make no um, uh, bones about it, has been a long-standing and enduring uh, problem. Um, and in fact, actually, if you look at those who are on remand, um, they are made up significantly of those who are untried, not those who um, have been tried and are awaiting uh, sentencing. Uh, the, the last uh, just the committee, uh, Justice Committee in the last session of Parliament, I think our first inquiry was on the issue of remand. Um, I think it was an excellent um, uh, inquiry. Um, it, I think, shed a lot of uh, light on, uh, on the issues um, ar arising. I'm sure that uh, Audrey Nicholl and her colleagues have gone over very similar uh, ground. I have to say that our report didn't necessarily come up with any obvious um, solutions. And I think some of that issue around the data um, uh, behind uh, remand remains as unclear as it was uh, back there. I think electronic uh, monitoring and bail were seen as um, uh, options for, for addressing some aspects of it, but none of it looked like a silver uh, bullet. So I, I certainly accept that action is needed. I, I welcome the bill, but it, in a sense I have some of the same misgivings about what the actual impact of this will be. And I, I note the committee itself um, has, has, has not arrived at a settled view uh, on that. I think the, the greater input from uh, criminal justice social work absolutely uh, makes sense. Um, I, I note what the Cabinet Secretary said in terms of additional uh, funding, but, but with what's happening to local government budgets, I think there is real concerns that this will be funded to be able to perform uh, the, uh, the, the duties that are being placed upon it. Funding too, I think, is critical in terms of, of through care. This has been under pressure for many years. Um, through redeployment in COVID, it was removed entirely for a, for a period, but it's absolutely key um, to rehabilitation um, and indeed uh, 
reducing reoffending uh, over the longer term. I welcome uh, the points being made in terms of standards um, being uh, statutory uh, standards being applied to this, and I also welcome the, the, the proposals in relation to. Uh, pre-release um, and not releasing on a Friday uh, or ahead of a, a, a bank holiday. The Justice Committees have heard for years the problems this caused. Uh, I think in terms of the, the changes in the bail test, obviously this is the, the, this is the key and probably most sensitive aspect of it. I can see the arguments for saying it simplifies it, but um, equally uh, Lord Carloway's uh, comments about um, uh, adding greater um, bureaucracy or making it more cumbersome I think need to be taken uh, seriously. I think the, the public safety um, test, and, and pr including the, the, the safety of, of victims, is absolutely critical, but also allowing a degree of leeway in terms of the, the, the kind of risk to prejudice of interests of uh, justice. Um, but how that is interpreted uh, by the courts um, would be, uh, I, I think, something that, that is not entirely clear uh, at this stage. And I note the points that have been made about this not necessarily making a huge amount of difference. The removal of Section 23D, again, I understand the, the concerns, though um, I, I, I would hope those can be allayed. And I, I know the, the, the committee have urged the Cabinet Secretary to undertake further uh, detailed conversations with Victims, um, uh, Victim Support Scotland, Rape Crisis Scotland and uh, others. So I, I find myself in not a wholly dissimilar uh, place to, to, to Katie Clark, maybe not quite as, as far as Jamie Green has, has reached. Uh, Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting uh, the, the principles of the bill this evening, uh, not least because uh, of the, uh, the, the context I set earlier. But I think we are concerned that through stage two and stage three, there is an awful lot of work to be done uh, to, to, I think, command the confidence of the judiciary, uh, of victims uh, and of this, uh, of this parliament. But I look forward to participating in those discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms MacArthur. We will now move to the open debate. I would advise members there is a bit of time in hand. So backbench bench speeches of around six minutes. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Donald Cameron. Mr McGregor. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Hey, I'm pleased to speak in this debate today as a member of the Criminal Justice Committee. And um, like others before me, I'd like to place on record my thanks to all those who gave evidence uh, and to the committee clerks for their tireless work on what I think we've all agreed is a pretty much outstanding uh, stage one report. Uh, the Scottish Government is wholly committed to transforming the justice sector, uh, something that we have been doing over a sustained period now. In Scotland, there is no denying we imprison too many people, something that is very much at odds with the often the Tory commentary on the SNP being soft in justice. Indeed, from my point of view, and I know many others on these benches, the evidence suggests we actually need to be using community alternatives more so. And we all do seem to be agreed on the fact that we do demand and imprison uh, far too many people. And I therefore welcome this bill being brought forward to try and address the problem. We are stepping away from the narrative that prison is solely for punishment. It isn't, and this has been widely accepted for some time now. But if we are to focus on rehabilitation and reparation, we have to consider that imprisonment is not always the best way forward for all those involved, both those who commit crimes and those who are victims of crime. In fact, we heard some evidence in committee, including from Professor Fergus McNeill and the Cabinet Secretary, stole my thunder on this because I thought that his uh, quote in committee uh, was absolutely brilliant. But it simply, he, he was making the point that simply putting people in prison without support can actually help to perpetuate a cycle of reoffending rather than the opposite. The bill's primary purpose is to amend the law to ensure alternatives to custody, custody are at the forefront of sentencing where appropriate. There is a wealth of evidence to show that community justice services are successful and with focus on rehabilitation and reintegration for those leaving prison, we will reduce crime overall. We must now take the evidence we have that those in prison are much more likely to have experienced trauma, mental ill health and have abuse and move on to a more trauma-informed response, something that I know the Cabinet Secretary and the, and the Government are very committed to. Of course, victim safety has to be at the core of any decision that we make also, and both physical and emotional harm must be considered when thinking about decisions made in relation to bail, and the convener was, was absolutely correct when she pointed out that we, we spoke to victims of crime as part of her scrutiny of this bill and heard some quite harrowing evidence. So we, we need to commit to working with victims' organisations such as Victim Support Scotland and Women's Aid, both of whom uh, submitted to the committee, to ensure that this legislation will continue to have victim safety at the core. The bill comes in two parts. Part one that amends the current law relating to this bill. This includes requiring justice social work to be given the opportunity to provide inf information to the court when making decisions about bail in all cases. And as a former ju a justice social worker myself, I think this is a welcome addition. And while social work reports are already often requested, 
and valued by the court, this new system will help to gather more information in cases where it may not have been available before. It should also lead to more... Yep, that's fine. McCarthy. To Fulton McGregor for taking intervention, um, as I said in my own remarks, that additional input from criminal justice social work um, I, I think can only be beneficial, but actually it has a, a resource implication as well, and, and the timing uh, of, of providing that sort of information will come at a cost as well. Is this something that the committee looked at and had any recommendations for the government on? No, I think you've been joining the Cabinet Secretary and having a look at my speech beforehand, because I'm just coming to that. But it should also, uh, as I was saying, it should also lead to even more use of bail supervision a valued intervention that can provide the courts with more confidence that a person is being monitored closely while they await trial or sentencing. And on Lee MacArthur's point, of course, this leads us to the obvious question over resources. Court social work teams are usually separate from community justice social work teams and tend to be relatively small. If we are to meet the policy objectives of this bill, there will need to be substantial resourcing of community justice. And the Cabinet Secretary uh, will be aware that I continually raised this during Stage 1 and almost all stakeholders recognised the need for investment. I do appreciate that finances are tight uh, currently, but if we are to get this right, there could be great savings at the other side, and that's something that you know, I think that the Cabinet Secretary uh, and the Government do recognise. And I also do welcome, I think it is fair to say, that, that there has been some further commitment to the Justice Social Work in this year's budget, um, but I would suggest that as this bill goes through and then hopefully becomes law, if that's the, the will of Parliament, that this may need to remain under regular review. And moving on to uh, part two of the bill, President Officer, uh, this part of the bill makes changes to some pris pris prisoner release arrangements and the support provided to those being released. And I think it's vital to ensure that sensible decisions can be made when someone is due to be released on a public holiday, for example, or before the weekend, and will then potentially face the difficulty accessing a whole range of services such as the bank, the doctors, surgeries, post offices, the job centre, the local council, addiction services, food bank and emergency housing. And that's quite a long list, but that's even just to name a few. And just as uh, Liam MacArthur said, I was uh, on the, the previous Justice Committee as well, and, and we've consistently, both in this uh, stage one and in previous Justice Committees, heard a lot of evidence um, on these issues of weekend release. Um, and it, it was made very clearly by, for example, the Wheatley Group um, during our stage one process when we went out to see them. Lots of concerns about around release times. And I, really welcome part two of the bill, although there are some concerns from colleagues around it, um, that, that can really to help to tackle this issue and make sure that people aren't just going to come out of um, uh, prison and, you know, uh, at least they've got an opportunity to, to be supported to not get involved in risk factors that could lead to reoffending. Um, so on that note, presiding officer, um, I would encourage the Chamber to vote for this bill at stage one um, and allow us to move forward to stage two together where we can consider amendments to improve it even further. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McGregor. I now call on Donald Cameron to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Around five minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, refer to my register of interest as a, a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, can I begin by thanking the committee for their stage one report? It's uh, a very lengthy and rigorous uh, document. Uh, and I think it's also this debate has been excellent so far. Uh, uh, refreshing to see both in the committee's report and in the chamber, um, members grappling with what, what are really difficult um, issues. Um, however, it, it is clear from the various criticisms within the, re with the report that there are several concerns from victim organisations about the provisions on bail. It's a well-known fact that one in four of all crimes are committed by those on bail, and in 2020 to 21, that included seven homicides. Now, as others have said, it is our belief on these benches that the outcome of this bill will lead to more offenders being released on bail and that this will subsequently lead to a rise in crime. And that was supported by witnesses to the committee, Kate Wallace of Victim Support. Yes, indeed. Cabinet Secretary. I understand, uh, first of all, thank you to the member for taking intervention. I understand the point he's making about increasing crime. Would he recognise that we have perhaps the lowest crime that we've had since we started recording crime, and in relation in particular to homicides, and I mean generally, not people that have been on bail, the lowest recorded number of homicides on record. Donald Cameron. I, I recognise the statistics that the Cameron Secretary stated, but at the same time, that does not mean that we should then enact provisions that may lead to an increase in crime. And Kate Wallace of Victim Support said that without any change to what is in place around bail, supervision, monitoring, management support, yes, she said, Logic tells that more people will be put at risk, there will be more victims of crime, 
and more lives will be ruined. And as someone who's acted for both prosecution and defence in our criminal courts, I know firsthand how this plays out. So can I urge him, urge the Cabinet Secretary, to think very carefully indeed about the uh, unintended consequences of this legislation. Now, the bill is designed to reduce the remand population in our prisons. We all know that is far too high. And the main factor pushing up the numbers on remand is the Scottish Government's failure to deal with a backlog caused by COVID. It's not the only point, the only factor. Liam MacArthur's right. It's been a long-standing problem, but it is now the main factor. There are nearly 30,000 trials currently backlogged in Scotland's courts. That's 10,000 more compared to pre-pandemic le levels. And it could take longer than three years to clear that backlog. And that's objectionable on, I, I don't have time, I've only got five minutes. I, I, I would love to take an intervention from Mr. Johnson, but it's objectionable because it will lead to unnecessary suffering for victims and their families. And we must take action to ensure the court system recovers faster. Turning to specific provisions in the bill, can I just draw out a, a few? Uh, section two of the bill seeks to change the grounds upon which a court may decide to refuse bail. And again, the committee heard warnings of the impact on victims. Scottish Women's Aid cautioned that the provisions will narrow the court's discretion to refuse bail, and that will risk the safety of victims of crime, particularly women, children and young people experiencing domestic abuse. Victims groups raise uh, concerns about Section 3 of the bill, repealing Section 23D. I think Katie Clark has spoken about this already. Um, that, that section in the 95 Act restricts the granting of bail in certain solemn cases. And again, there were warnings to the committee that this would remove a safeguard for the safety of victims in cases involving uh, sexual offences and domestic abuse. Uh, the committee also had concerns about Section 4 of the bill, which requires written reasons to uh, refuse bail. And they, they mentioned the time that take, that will take a court to fulfil the requirements uh, of that particular section, and that being a concern. And if this bill imposes more time-consuming requirements on the courts, this could make the backlog worse, which would exacerbate the underlying problem of a remand of population. It, it's, it's a vicious circle. And finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about Section 8 of the bill, about giving the Scottish Government power to make regulations to release groups of prisoners earlier than would be the case in an emergency situation. And the example given is a spread of a harmful infection in prison. Um, uh, and I think the committee concluded it wasn't persuaded of the need to enshrine that as an emergency power. And I think it's a very valid point. Um, these powers may well be needed, but they should only be applied for as emergency powers at the time that they are required. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, drawing to a close, there are a number of concerns that have been raised about this bill, uh, particularly over victim safeguards. And given that, um, and the need to put public safety first, I entirely support the decision of these benches to vote against the general principles at decision time. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I now call on Colette Stevenson to be followed by Carol Morgan. Uh, around six minutes, please, Ms Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for bringing this Stage 1 debate to Parliament today. Um, like others in the Chamber, I'd like to thank the witnesses who have come along to the Criminal Justice Committee to give evidence and to thank my colleagues and the clerks on the committee for work that they have done alongside me. The Scottish Government's overarching aim for the justice system is to improve public safety, support victims and re reduce rates of victimisation. The Bail and Release from Custody Bill is an important step in the Scottish Government's transformation of the justice sector and commitment to refocus how imprisonment is used. Scotland has a high remand population and the committee heard concerns from witnesses that almost a third of those in prison are on remand. In response to these concerns and the calls for action in this area, the Bill intends to change the way bail law operates so that those who do not pose a risk of serious harm are managed safely in the community. This bill recognises prison will always be necessary for the most serious cases, but we need to look again at how custody is used. History shows us that legislative intervention is needed to address the issue and, as the Cabinet Secretary highlighted, the primary purpose of this bill is not to reduce 
prison numbers, but rather to ensure the people who need to be held in custody are held in custody. Any decision on bail is for the independent courts to take in every case, of course, but the Bill aims to refocus how remand is used, though changes to the legal framework. The Committee had deliberations on electronically monitored bail, and by considering any time spent subject to an electronically monitored curfew condition against the duration of a custodial sentence, the courts ensure consistency and fairness across sentencing. Yeah, happy to take Jamie Green. It's very kind of the member to take my intervention. She will note, of course, that the summary of that discussion from the committee was that whilst it may be a welcome element of the sentencing, that judges' uh, decision-making, uh, there cannot be a formula. It should be left solely at the discretion of the judges. It's the right place to leave that power. Colette Stevenson. Yeah, I thank the member for that intervention, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. We, there was some discussion about the formula that's currently being used as well, and um, I, I wholly agree with you in terms of leaving it down to the discretion of the judges and the sheriffs on that. Thank you. So, however, the use of monitored remand has implications for the victims of crime, and I support the committee's views whilst agreeing with the proposal in principle that the courts should be given a degree of discretion in regard to adjustments of sentences, as I've just pointed out to Jamie Green. An important part of the justice system is to ensure rehabilitation and reintegration of people leaving prison to help them resettle in their communities. And the bill aims to give a greater focus to this. As a committee, we welcome proposals to ensure people are not released from prison on Fridays or bank holidays, for example. And if the bill is passed, this will ensure that prisoners have appropriate access to support services that operate through the working week. This will improve the risk management of and support for people vulnerable to re-offending. In addition, I support the committee's calls for the Scottish Government to publish minimum national standards in through care support alongside implementation of effective coordinated personal release planning across the prison service, the wider public sector and the third sector. To conclude, President Officer, the Bail and Release from Custody Bill is an important step in transforming the justice sector. It will ensure a fairer, more effective remand process in Scotland, and it will help with the rehabilitation and reintegration of people leaving prison. Importantly, this will help reduce reoffending so that there are fewer victims of crime. I agree with the Bill's aims and hope members will support the general principles today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Stevenson. I now call Cara Mochan to be followed by Rona Mackay. Around six minutes, please, Ms Mochan. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I also thank the committee for the work on this? Um, I have, not, have never been on uh, the Justice Committee, and so um, I found it interesting to take this particular debate on. Um, and I think the interesting point is that on looking at, at the, the, the stage one, it looked like something that you could easily be in support of. However, research, research and through showed that it was a lot of words and that really there needed to be, in the report from, from the committee, it talks about this, about clarity around a lot of it and also resourcing. So I hope to bring that as I go through uh, to, today. So we know from others that Scotland has the highest remand rates across the entirety of Europe, and yet, based on what I can see, what we can see at stage one, there is nothing here that directly addresses that, and that's a problem. I have a genuine concern that the government have not adequately engaged with the matters raised by experts in this field during the committee process. Um, and, and it seems to me that they do not understand that best practice already is already incorporated in, in much of the proposals here, um, but resourcing is a major issue. It was also interesting for me to, to speak to a colleague who brought to my attention that many of the recommendations uh, made by the Justice Committee in the last session, 2018, have not been realised, and that has already been brought in in some interventions today as well. 
What is required, which is so often the case, is increased financial support for the justice system rather than piecemeal reform that satisfies no one. And I was interested, the Cabinet Secretary said um, through care is not consistent. Um, in, in my view, through care is not resourced, and that needs, you know, we need some honesty around that. We have a bill that stage one does not make clear how it will address the issues outlined by the Criminal Justice Committee and those in the legal profession, policing and victim support, third sector organisations, and that has been stated by a number of members on the floor already. Um, and it absolutely does not provide the necessary funding or even really acknowledge the necessary funding, uh, or the government does not acknowledge the necessary funding, although the committee obviously do. There is clearly a need for reform based on what experts have told us, um, but the proposals set out here seem to have very unclear statistical data to support its conclusions. And I, I accept um, that data appears to be hard to come by, and others have mentioned that, specifically regarding how many people are in remand, or more about why and who they are and how that comes about. And we have had acknowledgements that even the previous committee did find that difficult. But I would be keen to see greater emphasis on data to, data to justify why these reforms are required, rather being ad addressed through sort of non-legislative legislative measures. Policy is better made if we truly understand, um, and this has been a frequent criticism of the bill. Beyond this, it is completely unclear from this proposal whether the bill will actually reduce the demand population at all. It, it, you know, it's just not clear. And surely that is the key aim here. And we've all said that, that you know, demand is far too high. And if not, it is difficult to justify to the public why this legislation is necessary. We have to provide measures by which we can assess whether these policies are working. Otherwise, I think it's quite right that the public ask questions about what are we doing. It is the case, as this currently stands, the bill adds to a significant layer of bureaucracy, um, and Scottish Labour and others are not convinced this will actually improve the situation. And ultimately, what we want to do is improve the situation, um, the backlogs, the demand situation, the, addressing the concerns of victims. We know that half of people on remand do not end up with custodial sentences at all, yet there is little here to actively address that. The new bail test is focused on public safety, but as someone who is not on the Justice Committee, that is poorly defined, which will really only lead to confusion and inconsistency. The lack of precision with, uh, with, will have with real-life consequences for a great many people. Um, you know, that you know, lack of precision around the definition of public safety um, will have great cons consequences, not least the victims of crime who are so often failed by the justice system, and we know that. If the public and law officers do not have confidence, uh, of course... Audrey Nicholl. I thank the member for giving way. Just on the point of a public safety definition, um, I, I agree most members, probably all members of the committee, um, scrutinised that particular issue. But I just point out my recollection of the evidence that we got from witnesses was that there was a, a desire for guidance on what is public safety, but there was not, as I recall, a specific request for uh, a definition. And I think that's perhaps because people understand a definition can be almost more difficult. Karen Walker. I thank the member for, uh, for the intervention and, and obviously I, I, I give way to, to your understanding of the bill and your experience in this area. But looking in, it did appear to me that it will be confusing if we are not actually clearer. Sometimes as lawmakers, we have to stand up and be counted and actually define what we mean by things. So if the public and law officers do not have confidence in what we define as public safety, um, then that definitely will be unclear as we go through the processes that will happen out there in the world. Um, and it will have a knock-on effect on the whole system as we go through. In regards to moving bail restrictions, we are also in the unusual situation where it is fairly unclear as to whether this reform will actually make it easier 
for those accused of serial sexual offences, and others have mentioned that, and domestic abuse to be out. Um, any reform here must satisfy the victims of crime and the organisations that represent them. Um, but I think we have heard that, that there are concerns there. In concluding, I'm aware of time. Um, as I've said many times before in this chamber, if we are to tackle the important work of legislation for this country, we must do it seriously and effectively. And I do have serious doubts the bills at this stage. Bad legislation is not good governance. And so I think, um, along with my other Labour Party colleagues, I think there is a lot of work to be done on this bill before it could become legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. I now call Rona Mackay to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Around six minutes, please, Ms. Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Around 700, 300 people are imprisoned in Scotland every year. Scotland's incarceration rate per 100,000 population is 135 compared to 66 in the Netherlands. We have one of the highest rates of remand compared to other countries in the UK or the European Union. So it's clear that we're locking up and remanding too many people as everyone in the chamber agreed about 18 months ago. And it's essential that new practice uh, happens if our justice system is to progress. As we've heard, the bill has not been straightforward, and I too would like to thank our many witnesses who gave evidence to the committee. I'd also like to thank the Clarks, Bill Team and Spice for their customary excellent support and advice. Presiding officer, uh, remand must be a last resort, and a much greater focus on prevention, reintegration and rehabilitation is the way forward, which is why I fully support the aims of this bill. Going back to the discussion about data, Daniel Johnson's... Yes, OK. Yeah. Katie Clark. Oh, um, to the member, and um, like myself, she's a member of the Criminal Justice Committee, so we've grappled with this legislation over many weeks. Does she think um, that it is more likely that somebody who is charged with a violent offence is likely to get bail in the future if this legislation was to go through? Rhoda Mackay. I don't believe so. I think that there's very, going to be very high risk assessment standards kept. Um, I, I mean, I do go on to discuss Section 23D in, in, in later in my speech, but in answer to that, no, I don't think so. Um, Yes, given this discussion around data, um, uh, around why remand levels are so high, um, I think Professor Fergus McNeill and uh, HM Chief Inspector of Prisons Wendy Sinclair Gibbon were correct when they said the lack of data makes it incredibly difficult to analyse and draw conclusions on this, and, and that's been what's been discussed. I think we're all in agreement with that. Uh, section 1 calls for input from Justice Social Work in relation to pre-trial bail decisions. The circumstances surrounding each person being considered for release is always different, and every decision should be taken with the maximum amount of information being made available to assist that. Howard League Scotland said in evidence that in too many cases, particularly involving women, people are remanded due to a lack of criminal justice social work reports. And as convener of the cross-party uh, group on women's families and justice, I find this very concerning. Uh, presiding officer, I led a members debate earlier this month to highlight the excellent report from families outside uh, the cost of imprisonment and release, which illustrates just how much imprisonment wrecks families and affects children. And I agree with uh, David Mackey of the Howard League when he says there's merit in specific reference to the rights of children being in the bill. That's something I hope the Cabinet Se Secretary could address when closing. Um, part two makes changes to prisoner release arrangements and support and through care being provided. Uh, my colleagues have outlined these already, so I won't repeat them. Um, presiding officer, I'd like to focus the rest of my contribution on part three of the bill on section 23D, which would remove some existing restrictions on granting bail and solemn procedures to allow the courts to apply the test used in other cases. The evidence we heard from the majority of witnesses and almost all of the legal professionals were in favour of the removal of these restrictions. However, Scottish Women's Aid and Victim Support Scotland have concerns about the implications of this for domestic abuse offenders, and I do too. Due to the unique nature of domestic abuse and gender-based violence, perpetrators continue to pre present a risk of some degree to women, children and young people for long periods following their involvement in the criminal justice system. And this must be taken into account when determining suitability for release. This is individual risk, not public safety risk, and should be dealt with in that way. Given women's experience of abusers being given bail, women need as much protection as the law can afford them. 
Victim Support Scotland believe the current restriction contained within Section 23D was inserted to emphasise the seriousness of the risk associated with cases involving women and girls. Presiding officer, uh, despite being given assurances from witnesses that the removal of 23D would not mean more risk to women, I hope the Cabinet Secretary will address how important it is that women are reassured the bill will not impact them. Women must have confidence that the justice system will protect them. In a similar vein, uh, and in the unlikely event of emergency release of pr prisoners being necessary for whatever reason, I believe the restrictions under the coronavirus bill regarding domestic abusers should remain, and I intend to speak to the Scottish Government about bringing forward an amendment in that regard. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, uh, this is clearly a, a complex bill and not without its issues. Uh, Katie Clark talked about the bill being a missed opportunity. Um, I would suggest that it is a missed opportunity for Labour uh, not to agree to the general principles of this bill to change the culture of imprisonment and remand, which we, we desperately need to do. So I urge the Chamber to support the general principles today, despite our differences in detail, which can be worked out in later stages. We must change the culture of remand and custody within the justice system, and prison must always be a last resort. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members may wish to know that we do have um, a little time in hand this afternoon. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this bill and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the open and frank discussions we have had about its provisions and for the sensitivity with which he has, which he has shown in responding to many issues raised by members of the public and members of the Criminal Justice Committee. I'm acutely aware of the concerns of organisations representing victims and survivors, especially of sexual violence and domestic abuse. I refer members to my register of interests and my experience in, organise, in organisations supporting those who have experienced rape and sexual assault. It is vital that the specific safety needs of such survivors are not only clear on the face of the bill, but that all necessary frameworks of support, protection and information, including for children, are in place properly funded and freely accessible. Survivors need the whole system to work for them, and incarceration of offenders is only a part of the justice, care, recognition and respect which they so greatly deserve. For one of the tragedies of our society is this, that the effects of violence and abuse upon women do not always lead to their being recognised as victims or survivors. Often they lead to situations where the women themselves are charged with, with criminal offences. There is a real danger for us in our relative comfort and privilege of viewing perpetrators and victims of crime as binary categories, of imagining a bright line between those who are prosecuted and those we seek to protect. And it is truly shocking that for many women, prison is seen as the safest place to be. For the sake of those women, for the sake of us all, we cannot and must not forget the fundament fundamental principle that each accused person is entitled to a presumption of innocence unless and until they are proved guilty. That is why bail is a right, not a privilege. So where situations arise where bail has to be refused, it is only right, as this bill provides, that written reasons are given by the court. If a person not convicted of any crime is to be denied their liberty, they have the right to know why and to have that information communicated in ways that they can understand and consider properly, not just here briefly amidst the confusion and emotion of the hearing. Yes. Jamie Green. H having uh, witnessed, uh, thank you to the member for taking my intervention, having witnessed uh, uh, quite a large volume of these hearings, the judges will always give very clear and valid reasons to their decision making. And if that went to appeal, then it would be naturally put in writing. What they are concerned about is delaying cases due to having to transcript absolutely everything that's said in court, and we already know how expensive that is. Maggie Chapman. I, I, I thank the member for that intervention. I think it is just really, really important to understand that not everybody will share the same level of understanding or access to that information in the time when emotions are running high and where the context of the hearing is not perhaps the most uh, conducive for, for understanding that information. This bill is not about prison numbers, it is not about statistics, but it is about people. People who are, not always, but very often, the most disadvantaged, vulnerable, poorest and most excluded. 
We know, as illustrated by the scandal of deaths related to drug use, that Scotland is a deeply traumatised society, one in which many have experienced childhoods of loss and deprivation, have never known emotional availability, a sense of control without risk-taking, stillness that does not reawaken trauma. That trauma, to our collective shame, is both exacerbated and newly created by experiences of the criminal justice system and by prison in particular. There is a reason why we have to talk so much about reintegration, for incarceration itself is a process of disintegration. And that disintegration, that trauma, those losses are inflicted not just upon the imprisoned person, but upon those who love and depend on them. It is not the case that locking people up is a risk-free option. It is accumulating risk for the future, for that person, for their family, community and wider society. We are taking people who need care and punishing them for that need. It is no surprise that the pressure for many is unbearable. This bill, I hope, can be part of a wider move away from incarceration as our, def as our default solution to social harm away from the idea that only by imprisonment can society express disapproval, away from the toxic language of monsters and thugs and scum. For we know that some of the most serious of harms, those social and environmental harms perpetrated by the crimes of the powerful, are often met with quite a different response. Prison, like war, is an easy-sounding so-called solution that merely avoids dealing with the real causes of harm. And we know what those causes are, inequality, misogyny, poverty. And we know much about how to address those causes, about what works. We know m more, much more is required in many ways, not least in terms of time, staff and resources for our public and third sector agencies. In implementing the law contained in this bill, we'll need to use the best tools available, including bail conditions, with real support when and where it's needed and where it's truly necessary, electronic monitoring as a last alternative before custody. For such monitoring is essentially punitive, a fundamental interference by the state with the liberty of an unconvicted person. It must not be used simply because it is there. There is much to be done within and outside criminal justice to transform a system that is currently failing everyone, victims, survivors, perpetrators, and the public. People leaving prison need to be able to access basic services, healthcare, social security, and most fundamental of all, appropriate housing. So the vital provisions such as ending Friday releases must be part of a wider and deeper framework of support. We need credible non-custodial responses to crime, including more restorative and community justice, because prison is not a place of safety, not a place of recovery, not a place of rehabilitation. For those already in the prison system, we need support, therape therapeutic communities, humane and healing places to live and thrive, places like the new Bella Centre in Dundee. We need this bill, supported by frameworks of resource, cooperation and protection as part of the transformational change that Scotland deserves. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also take this opportunity to thank the committee for their report, which I think outlines uh, the situation very clearly. Justice is a cornerstone of our society. It is the most fundamental role of government to ensure the safety of the citizens. It is a duty that should not be taken lightly and should not be an area of compromise. We must do everything we can to ensure that everyone is as safe as possible putting the victims of crime at the centre of any and all policy. We need to be firm. We need to be thorough. We must ensure that justice is carried out. Presiding officer, on this basis, I have strong reservations about this bill as presented to Parliament. In many places, it seems to put the feelings of criminals above the safety and security of our communities. It also seems to represent some sort of a power grab for Scottish Ministers. And let me take these themes in turn. During the Stage 1 report, a gap in the law was identified regarding the Parole Board's inability to reverse a decision recommending release to a prisoner on licence 
where the offender breached their release conditions. This is simply unacceptable. Parole officers must have the ability to react to behaviour and information regarding a case as it presents itself and must not be tied to something decided beforehand. This can and will inevitably lead to criminals being wrongly released back into the public. I hope that this loophole will be fixed before the final bill is voted on at stage three. Another subject that was brought up during the stage one report was the fact that the committee were not wholly persuaded of the need for Scottish ministers to have the power to release prisoners early. I would go even further than the committee and say that I am wholly persuaded that there is no need for ministers to have the power to release prisoners early. There, are, there was a case to be made during the pandemic that the government needed to make these kinds of decisions quickly in response to a rapidly evolving public health landscape. But now that we are past such a time, I do not understand why we need to extend this. Is it that ministers do not trust parole boards? Sorry, I'll take an intervention for Mr Brown. Keith Brown. And I thank uh, Jeremy Balfour for taking intervention. I wonder if he thinks it is wholly unacceptable for the Scottish Government to have the power for emergency release. Why it would be justifiable for other governments, such as the UK Government, to have that power, but not for the Scottish Government? Jeremy Balfour. Well, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his intervention? I mean, I am here to represent the people of Lothian. I've been elected to the Scottish Parliament. And what I want to see is the best legislation here for Scotland. And in my view, this is not a power that is acceptable to have. Is it that ministers do not trust parole boards or are justice systems more broadly to make decisions in line with the best interests of general public victims and even in the prisoners themselves? This process does not need to be in the hands of political actors. It should be controlled by those who are on the ground every day. And again, I hope the Parliament can amend this aspect of the bill in the coming sessions. Finally, President Officer, I want to come on to what I hope can be a point of agreement across the Chamber. In 2015, Nicola Sturgeon said she would end the soft touch practice <clears throat> of automatic early release, saying, our objective remains to end the policy of automatic early release completely as soon as we are able to this was a commitment that, was, that we welcomed, as it is, represents a move away from a soft touch system. Call me crazy, but I believe that if a sentence is passed, it should be served in a strange world in which four years really means two. As I said, we welcome this commitment from the First Minister. However, we are now eight years on, and this practice is still happening in Scotland. This looks very much like another SMP promise broken. We want to give the government an opportunity to rectify this. We think that this bill is a perfect opportunity for them to follow through on their promise and end automatically early release once and for all. And I would be interested to hear if the Cabinet Secretary respond to this in his closing um, statement. To conclude, Presiding Officer, I think that there is a potential to do good with this bill. But because of the misgivings that I have outlined regarding ministerial overreach and the gap in law identified by the Stage 1 report, I won't be voting for this bill today. If it goes ahead, I hope we can work to improve it, and I look forward to playing my part. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, I feel I need to begin by pointing out to Jeremy Balfour that it was Conservative ministers in the 1990s that introduced automatic early release. Now, I think we do need to look at how that looks, uh, works. I think we do need actually sentencing that is clear, but I think if we're going to raise this, we do need at least a little bit of acknowledgement about where that actually came from. And indeed, I think we need to, in this debate, and in a, and in a sense, I think we already have, use this to face up to some stark realities. Because while I think we all would like to think that Scotland is a progressive country, 
uh, that we tend to do things in a progressive way. When you look at our prisons and our prison statistics, I think you quite quickly get disabused of that. Because as other people have pointed out, we do imprison more of our population and we do use remand more than not just other European countries, but the rest of the United Kingdom. And let, let's be very clear about that. That has been a long and sustained position. If you look at the, the data over the last 20 years, the use of remand as a proportion of the total prison population has been around twice that of other UK jurisdictions. And we need to ask ourselves why. Because if we're looking at remand and you looking at release, we need to ask ourselves the, the questions. And I think with uh, remand, we need to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? And we don't have uh, explanations. We, why do we not have the data? And to look at the impact, and the impact is really critical, because I think if there's one element that has not been looked at, is actually what happens to people when they're on remand. And it's not just its use, it's the fact that when people are on remand, they don't have access to purposeful activity. So you're very often taking people who are sentenced for a, low, a, a lesser crime, putting them in prison with nothing to do, without the access to health care that sentenced prisoners often get, and putting them into contact with people who've committed much more serious crimes. And what do we expect to happen? And the final question I think we need to ask ourselves is the purpose of remand. And I think ultimately we do need to acknowledge the fact that sometimes we will need to put people in prison and we do need to use remand. But the simple fact is this, is that only about a half of people accused of summary uh, uh, crimes end up with custodial sentences. But for women, and we've already heard that women are a higher proportion than men in, in, in terms of the remand population, but for women, 70%, 70 percent end up with non-custodial sentences. Now, that is shocking. And I think until we adequately probe the reasons that we are using remand at the levels we are and why, we are not going to make progress. And likewise, in terms of uh, the release elements, we need to look at the critical uh, elements, because ultimately, it's the manner of prisoners' release, I think, which will underline whether or not they are going to uh, go on to commit future crime. Their access to health, housing and their ongoing means of support. So I welcome some of the things, but I do worry that this bill runs the risk that I think many other previous justice bills have encountered from this government. That it is uh, you heavy on gesture, heavy on changing definitions, but light on resource and light on systemic and structural change. And I think that's where this bill goes wrong. So in terms of bail, I think it is good that it, this will require recording of reasons. Because while reasons are given in court, they're not centrally recorded. And this was a critical part of the, the report that the Justice Committee in the last Parliament looked at. And there is no good reason for that. Uh, indeed, we, we found that actually many courts are using forms to record those reasons, but they're just not centrally collated. That will be a positive step, as will Friday release. But as for the requirements for social work, that is something that is largely already happening. The problem isn't that, that courts aren't seeking that information that assessments of risk, the background information of prisoners, is that those social work functions aren't adequately functioned. This bill won't correct that. And likewise, the public safety test. When we spoke to sheriffs when we did our inquiry in the last parliament, it wasn't that they weren't applying that, they clearly were. Indeed, I would argue that if you look at sections 23b and c of the Criminal Justice Code, if, you, uh, if, if one of the, the, the criteria is whether or not a, a person will go on to commit future crime while on bail, that is public safety. So I agree with Fred McIntosh, and for those of you who know Fred McIntosh's political background, it's not often I agree with him, but if it is, what he said was if it's intended to be a change, then it needs more detail. If it's not, then it's pointless. And I agree with Fred McIntosh KC on that point. And I agree with the Lord President about whether or not, questioning whether or not this will make any practical difference. And on release, again, I think it is good that there is a plan. But Critically, what we need is resource and minimum standards. And through the passage of the Management of Offenders Bill in the last Parliament, I brought forward amendments which would have required uh, act, uh, registration with the GP, required access to housing, required access to proof of ID, and required uh, access to means of support, whether that be uh, through benefits or uh, applying for jobs. We need those sorts of guarantees and commitments in law. I, think, I fear that while the guidance could address some of these things, that we will, and, but without resource, without those commitments, both prisoners will understand what they should expect, nor be able to actually claim it 
and, and frankly, we will make no practical progress in, in uh, addressing those things. Because ultimately, if prisoners don't have a means of supporting themselves out of prison, if they don't have access to a GP, they will go on to commit crime again. Ultimately, I think where this bill really fails, though, is its failure to establish uh, adequate alternatives to bail. Because in our inquiry in the last Parliament, that was the clear message we got from sentences, that they only used bail as a, last, as a remand as a last resort. And it was that absence of clear, credible and trustworthy alternatives to remand that was the, the, the fundamental impediment to them using them. That's what this bill needs to put in place. It's what it doesn't. It's why I agree with my colleagues that at the moment we will abstain uh, on the, the purposes, general purpose of this bill because we can't support them. You know, ultimately, we need a justice system that's effective. I think terms of hard and soft justice are nonsense. We need things that work, but we need practical solutions and resources if we're going to have those solutions that work. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I call Jackie Dunbar, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to take part in today's Stage 1 debate, and I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank everyone involved um, in the scrutiny and the process of the report so far. Um, I haven't been part of that process, but like Liam MacArthur, I have read and digested the report as, as much as I possibly could. Justice policy and, indeed, how we treat those in custody is a hallmark of our society. And this Scottish Government has a proven track record of bringing about progressive change to Scotland's justice system and to ensure it is a system which absolutely focuses on rehabilitation, on improving life chances of those who end up in the prison estate and one which has human rights at its centre. It's my view that this bill is a next step in that journey, ensuring that the justice system is able to respond to increasing demand. And as this bill ensures that folk are not unnecessarily placed in the custodial estate with all the disruption we know and have heard today that that causes. This bill will make a real difference to the lives of folk who have been affected by imprisonment, many of whom have adverse life experiences, and it will help reduce reoffending, leading to fewer victims in the future. Many folk in contact with the, with the criminal justice system have already experienced severe and multiple disadvantages, including homelessness, substance misuse, mental ill health, and domestic uh, violence or abuse. Individuals from 10% of the most deprived areas are overrepresented in prison arrivals by a factor of three, a finding consistent across the last 10 years. And care experienced folk are also disproportionately represented within the, the prison population. Around a quarter of the prison population in Scotland report being in care as a child rising to just under half when looking specifically at young folk in custody. I... Yes, of course. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Jackie Dunbar, for an intervention. Just listening to the debate today, and it's making me think about a case that I have locally that I've been working on with a young person on remand, which could be up to 140 days. And young people are not allowed any access to any activities like prison work or any learning. So I'm just wondering if Jackie Dunbar agrees with me that this bill might allow for some changes to be made to the current remand system so that young folk might be allowed access to certain activities while on remand. Jackie Dunbar. Uh, I thank Emma Harper for her intervention. I absolutely agree with what you're, what you're saying. Uh, I think that young folk on remand should be allowed access to the rest of the activities which general young, young person prison population have access to. Uh, and I would welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments on this if he agrees with us too, uh, maybe in his closing up, or if it's the the, the Minister. Um, Presiding Officer, Scotland is a modern and progressive society and the Scottish Government's overarching aim for the justice system in Scotland is to improve public safety, support victims and reduce rates of victimisation. Evidence shows that this is best achieved by reducing crime, reducing reoffending and having fewer folk experiencing crime. Keeping our communities safe and protecting victims must remain a priority for us all. 
However, we must also recognise the severe and multiple deprivation experienced by many folk who encountered the criminal justice system and the damaging impact that imprisonment can have on individuals, their families and their wider communities. This is smart, compassionate justice that emphasises the need to protect victims, to ensure public safety and give those who have offended the support they need to make different choices in their lives so that they can make a positive contribution to, to our and their communities. Too often we see folks cycle back into the criminal justice system and into prison because they cannot access the support they sorely need in the community. Collectively, we can do better, and so the Bill includes a focus on the support provided to folk leaving prison so that they do not re-offend. I therefore welcome that the Bill is aimed at making a real difference to the lives of individuals affected by imprisonment, many of whom have adverse life experiences. And I particularly welcome that the Scottish Government is funding trauma specialists to develop a framework for training staff to create a more trauma-informed and trauma-responsive justice system. The new vision for justice recognises the prevalence of trauma and endorses a more person-centred and trauma-informed justice system. The Scottish Government have commissioned NHS Education for Scotland to create a knowledge and skills framework specifically for, to support a trauma-informed workforce in the justice sector. Victims will take a more prominent role in cases, experience fewer delays and be supported in their recovery. And I ask uh, for a commitment that this will be a central tenant to the Bill. We, we, we really need to keep that in focus. In conclusion, this bill will improve Scotland's justice system and will continue our journey to Scotland being a more progressive, caring nation. And I support the Government today. Thank you. We are in a position to be generous to those closing this afternoon. An extra minute or two can certainly be accommodated. And I call Pauline McNeill. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. <laughs> Jamie's worried. I'll begin by actually agreeing with Jamie Green actually that I think the report itself is a very considered report. I I'll be honest, I mean, I, I thought it was a highly technical and difficult report to produce because of the very nature of it. And I think there needs to be some further discussion here about what not we all agree on, but to get down to focus on how this bill could actually work. I want to talk a bit about that. Um, to a person, we are agreed that Scotland's remand population is extraordinarily high, the highest in Europe. But we don't even know exactly why that is. We have some clues, but we don't know overall why that is the case. And that is concerning. We know that half of those remanded will not be found guilty. I mean, I find that figure really disturbing. So we don't know why they were remanded in the first place then, if they go on not to get a custodial sentence. So it is a big problem to solve. It's probably one of the most important things, I think certainly criminal justice policy, to try and bring a resolution to this. Because as well as losing your liberty, people losing their homes, access to their children and their jobs while they're on remand awaiting trial. And I think another speaker previously talked about the impact of the delays, particularly during COVID and the extended number of days you can now uh, remain on remand till we get the ports, courts back into proper timescale. It is extremely damaging. So I think there's a lot of which we all do agree on. The question is, does the bill in front of us, in its current forum, do much to change the culture we're talking about? But more importantly, and it's what I want to talk about at length, does it provide the clarity that we require so that everyone, whether you agree or disagree with the provisions or aspects of the provisions, do we all understand what is intended to do? And that's one of my primary concerns. The bill seeks to introduce a number of reforms to refocus how imprisonment is used. And as I said, uh, Liam MacArthur made this point really well. We haven't got to the bottom of why that is. In fact, it's a question that also stumps leading figures across the justice sector. David Abernethy, the governor of HMP Edinburgh, said it was a mystery to him why Scotland had such a high rate of remand. What is indisputable is that we do need more data in order to understand the remand population as a whole. Only data we really have is age and gender. So we need to do better on that. 
One thing that's apparent to me in this debate, and Philip McGregor talked about this, and he talks about this a lot in the committee, and that is the obvious way to strike the balance here about who you want to remand to custody, who you're going to let out on bail, and those who might want to be supervised on bail. And the Justice Member saw this in action, actually, in Glasgow uh, Sheriff Court, that sheriffs do use the supervised bail provisions. And it is a partial answer. I think it's quite a big answer, actually, to this. And I'd like to have more discussion with the government on the use of this. But I want to focus my concerns in relation to part one. Now, I said from the outset, <laughs> I find this particularly difficult to get my head around, so I'm happy to be corrected in any detail, but this is, I've spent some time looking at this. So the focus of the bill is to limit custody to those who post a risk of public safety or where it's necessary to prevent significant risk of prejudice. So there are clearly benefits to reducing the damage effects that we've talked about or short-term detention. But it's important to note that, according to the government, that it was still allowed to remand cases uh, in the interest of public safety, and that was also, importantly, uh, protection of the victim themselves and any substantial risk that they may abscond um, for further offences is also included. But beyond that, there is quite a bit of concern about the detail of, of understanding of the way in which those provisions have been drafted. Now, one thing I wanted to say is it was not made clear to the committee, and I wasn't clear about it, that Section 3AC, which is um, of the 95 Act, which relates to domestic abuse offences. Now, we only know this because we scrutinised the 2018 legislation last week that that section only went in five years ago. Now, I would have preferred it was drawn to our attention that something we only put in five years ago is going to be removed by the removal of 23D. Now, at this stage, I'm not for or against the removal. I'm just pointing that out. Now, the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society and others, um, they don't believe a one-size-fits-all, so they're quite content with the removal of it. Victims' organisations have concerns. Now, can I plea to the Cabinet Secretary, point one, there needs to be a lot more detailed discussion before we get to the later stages of this bill about reassuring victims' organisations, if you're going to proceed with this, that there are provisions in the bill that can be used, because, because I think there's a, certainly either disagreement or a lack of understanding. Now, in my last few minutes, I want to talk about Lord Carlowey's letter uh, in uh, some substance. Being quoted already by Katie Clark and others, Lord Carlowey says to the government that it constitutes a highly structured and prescriptive staged approach. They think it's unnecessary and cumbersome and is an artificial process. Now, we had an exchange about whether there should be a definition or whether there should be guidance. But what's confusing is in the very long transcript from Lord Carlowey to the government, they themselves, the judges themselves, are saying that if the concept of public safety is to mean, for example, the protection of the public from any offending behaviour, then the outcome regarding remand in custody may be a little different from present. I mean, they go on to say that, um, so it might be understood as referring to safety in the ordinary sense, i.e. freedom from injury, danger or risk. Then many offenders who appear in the summary courts are charged with crimes of dishonesty or public disorder who pose a substantial risk of continuing to offend whilst awaiting trial will require to be released on bail. It is therefore clear that the proposal, depending on how exactly the concept of public safety is to be defined, has the potential to constitute a substantial narrowing of the court's powers to remand in custody. Now, judges are against the narrowing of those powers, but clearly they are saying to the government, um, depending on how you define public safety or what the guidance is, if you like, they are not really sure what you're really getting at and the way the legislation is drafted. They're also saying they're not persuaded that there's any justification for further limiting the powers exercised in the courts. There also seems to be some uh, clarity required over whether or not someone who fails to appear uh, can be remanded to custody or not, but appears not. But some of the examples that the judges give in a very lengthy discussion about what they would do if a continued failure to appear, uh, whether or not a trial would actually uh, proceed, which of, uh, under su summary proceedings, but not solemn, can proceed without the accused being there. But I mean, that's really not something that is desirable. And they say that apart from anything else, the current proposal removes the court's powers to remand an accused to custody if they propose a flight risk. I appreciate these are things which, in stage two, you could address. In respect of non-appearance, they go on again to see um, that there are certainly cases where 
Um, it would, under the current law, it would oblige the court to grant bail. Um, there are 15 pages of this. I'm sure I'm not going to go through them all. It's suffice to say this, that this needs addressed. This, this, it really concerns me that the judiciary are not clear about what the provisions are expected to do. And it gives me some nerves. It gives me some nerves, the victims' organisations, and I'm not saying they're accurate in what they're saying, but they are nervous about the removal of some states. In conclusion, presenting officer, and thank you for the additional time, because I really needed to do that. Um, we will be abstaining tonight. I'll leave the door open for further discussion at stage two. Uh, we do want to do something good here. We want legislation that's actually effective and is understood by everyone in what its intentions are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I call on Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Um, in the nine months since this bill was introduced to Parliament, the Criminal Justice Committee has consumed many thousands of words written and spoken. There has been lengthy and often conflicting testimony from 26 witnesses 32 published responses and 13 letters. And 10 days ago, we published our 50-page Stage 1 report. And I'd like to thank the clerks who do so much hard graft, often unseen. Now, despite this vast volume of material, the committee has often struggled to get specific information we need and straight answers to our questions. As others have said, I find this incredibly frustrating. As MSPs, we are required to analyse, assess and stress test legislation, but are then restricted in getting basic facts. Now, in our Stage 1 report, every single committee member, including those of the SNP, stated the following. We have faced challenges in obtaining accurate and clear information on the reasons for remand and the characteristics of Scotland's remand population. What kind of way is this to legislate. We have been here before with flawed and rushed legislation, but putting aside my wider concerns about how this place functions, I have serious worries about this bill, far too many to cover in my few minutes today. One concern is around sentencing in relation to time spent in bail while subject to electronic monitoring. The bill says that two days of electronically monitored bail will be the equivalent to one day already served. What this means is that judges would be expected to deduct that bail time from whatever sentence they impose. Now, this is quite different to the existing practice of judges taking into account time served on remand when sentencing. But once the law says that sitting in the comfort of your own home with an electronic tag in your ankle is the same as jail time, what might happen? I believe that every criminal in Scotland will find reasons to delay their trial, knowing that every two days in the House counts for one day exactly. off any eventual jail time. The churn already blights our courts. This may fuel it. This risks worsening chronic court backlogs. It will also, I believe, further betray victims and erode public trust in what is often smoke and mirrors sentencing and what this actually means. Now, many other valid points have already been articulated by my colleagues Jeremy Balfour and Donald Cameron. Jamie Green spoke about the concern of victims groups and the judiciary. Uh, those representing frontline police officers say the bill would be, and I quote, an, as unwelcomed by uh, communities plagued by repeat offenders. Now, I will address a, contrib a, a, con a contribution from one key supporter of the bill. The penal reform charity Howard League Scotland says the bill is, and I quote, an opportunity to challenge the entrenched practices of some members of the judiciary who appear to accept the Crown's opposition to bail applications too readily. They added, again quoting, we would suggest that significant cultural change particularly among some parts of the Crown and Judiciary, will be required for these changes to take effect. Now, I asked the Howard League representative to expand on this. It turned out that he was, in fact, a member of Scotland's Judiciary as a part-time sheriff. But, frankly, I'm still no clearer about what was meant. The suggestion seems to be 
that my learned friends are some sort of out of touch, regressive dinosaurs. But even if the people who believe that are unwilling, unwilling or unable to offer any evidence to back it up. Now, the same witness also used the phrase, which I think goes to the nub of what this bill is really about. And that phrase was appetite risk. Radical changes to bail and a reduction in imprisonment will come at a likely cost to communities. That being more crime, more victims, more misery. Do the people of Scotland share this appetite risk? I don't think they do, and I don't think that they should. Now, this brings me on to the issue of cost, described by one witness in the Stage 1 report as the elephant in the room. Now, stretched criminal justice social workers will be burdened with even more work. The bill's financial memorandum can be summarised effectively as, don't worry, it won't cost much. Yet witnesses warn that the government has significantly underestimated the costs. COSLA calls for detailed financial assessment on the impact on councils before the bill is enacted. And Daniel Johnson made these points about cost very well. Now, we don't know, we, we don't even know if criminal justice social work will form part of the proposed new national care service. Now, Kevin Stewart admitted to the committee that he's spending £80,000 of taxpayers' money on a private contractor to answer that question. And depending on who the SNP members decide will be the next First Minister, there might not even be an NCS. Presiding officer, there are many more concerns which are for another day. But to conclude, we don't have the information we need. We don't know the intended purpose of the bill. We don't know what problems it seems to be trying to fix. Whatever they are, we don't know how they can be quantified or achieved. Some people say this bill is game-changing. Others say it will change nothing. Some say it will help ease the court backlog. Some say it will make it even worse. We don't know how much this might end up costing taxpayers. Now, this government likes to talk about what it calls smart justice, but there's absolutely nothing smart about this half-baked approach to lawmaking. Social experimentation, flying blind, tinkering, call it what you want. It speaks to a government which is out of ideas and out of touch. Now, I note that Labour will today abstain despite one of the two committee members opposing the general principles of the bill. Our party cannot support the bill, but we do commit to working constructively to improve it. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Keith Brown to wind up around 10 minutes or so, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and honestly, thank you to everyone who has spoken today. Um, I welcome, of course, the support that has been expressed for the Bill's key aim of refocusing how we use imprisonment in Scotland, and also express my thanks again to the Criminal Justice Delegated Powers and Law Reform and Finance and Public Administration Committees for their consideration of the Bill, and to all those who contributed as witnesses. And if I can, just turn to, first of all, the points that have been raised during the debate. I regret that we will not have the support of the, consent, uh, of the Conservative Party. I have to say that my expectation was that we would not have the support of the Conservative Party. I would predict we will not have the support of the Conservative Party for any proposal that we make during this Parliament to progress justice in Scotland. It will be opposed regardless of the fact that, for example, in this case, we all agreed on the need to try and tackle the issue in terms of remand just over a year or so ago, and that seems to have gone by the board. And if people need any evidence of that. The futility of trying to work with the Conservatives, if we listen to the speech that's just been made, essentially a single transferable speech that we get from Russell Finlay every time he gets to his feet, a, a tabloid-type tirade. I mean, just some of the words, this is going to result in more crime uh, and more victims and more misery. That, that's, that's the considered response to the proposals that are being made here. He also said, for example, a point-by-point... Point... I will do, yes. Russell Finlay. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with Victim Support Scotland, whose evidence was indeed that this bill will lead to more crime in our communities? Yep. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's valid. The, the member mentioned during his speech a number of different witnesses 
many of whom had different points of view from other witnesses, even within, for example, the judiciary. So, of course, there were different views that were brought forward. But what we had from Mr Finlay was a point-by-point -point attack on every part of the bill. There is no way there's any consensus going to be arrived at any reasonable discussion uh, in relation to this. There was nothing put... No, I'm sorry, I've got to try and make some progress. And I do note, of course, that, unfortunately, uh, Mr Green wouldn't take an intervention from me, even though he was given more time to make a speech at the start than I was, even though he had three minutes left when I asked to intervene. There was nothing positive from the Conservative Party. There was nothing constructive. I think a number of members have mentioned the fact that it is hard, very hard, and many people have tried to get to the bottom of why remand is so high. Um, but we have to try and uh, address the issue. But nothing was suggested uh, from the Conservatives whatsoever. It ended up with saying it was a half-baked, um, ten-eared approach. So, Let's not fool ourselves. There's any point in trying to have a discussion with the Conservatives on these justice measures. We're not going to get a change in that attitude. It does leave the rest of us with the opportunity and the obligation to try and see where we can make progress in relation to this. I listened to the comments made by a number of um, Labour members, in particular Daniel Johnson, who I think was very hard to disagree, even where he made some uh, trenchant uh, observations about the uh, proposal. There were some very good uh, interventions also. I know he, he was unable to stay, but Liam MacArthur's uh, intervention as well. I am very grateful that um, uh, the Liberal Democrats will be supporting the general principles of the bill at stage one. Um, so, and I, I, just to come back to, of course, the concluding points made by Polly McNeill, there is no piece of uh, information which I have said we will not provide. There is no um, uh, unwillingness on the part of the government to discuss that. In fact, she will know this week I made the initiative to speak to her myself again about some of the issues of concern, and I will continue to do that. I have done it throughout the various appearances at the committee, the responses to the committee, the discussions that I have had with members. There has been no unwillingness. I do not again say the point that she made, that she still feels there is more to be said, there is more information to be provided, and the point made by both her and a number of other members about data. I understand that point. The government has to be careful when it provides data, but I understand the point that was being made. And it may help produce some more information which might help us better understand why we have the high prevalences eh, of remand that we currently do have eh, in Scotland. But just to address a point, it, it, it Donald Cameron made the point about the backlog, and it, it, that is true. It is not unique to Scotland. Every, every jurisdiction has problems with the backlog caused by COVID. But at least acknowledge that from 44,000 down to less than 30,000 in the space of 18 months shows some progress um, towards reducing that backlog. That is in relation to uh, summary cases. It is also true, as Rona Mackay said, that um, there are issues around uh, Section 23D, and I am happy to listen, as she asked that I would do, to some of the concerns there are uh, around the, the, the removal of se uh, Section 23D. However, this removal is the exact opposite of what Jamie Green had said in terms of interfering with the judiciary. If you listen to the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society, they both said this is, increases the scope of the court to deal with these issues. It previously, or currently rather, it limits the scope of the court. So this was increasing uh, the scope of the court. And just to, to go back to the point where Jamie Green, I think, made comments about this was being, he didn't say an attack, but he said it was undermining to some extent judicial independence. Uh, it's clearly the case that judges interpret the law. They don't make the law. This is the role of Parliament. We can't absolve ourselves of the responsibility to make law because another part uh, of the state, in terms of the judiciary, has uh, observations which might contradict us. We still have to take decisions on the law. There is no intention, and I don't think Lord Carloway would say, that this is going to affect judicial uh, independence. So I think that point um, is uh, very important to bear in mind that we are giving more power to the courts in relation, uh, in relation to these issues. And it's right that we should do that. I think that's one of the observations that we've heard. I, I will do, yes. Katie Clark. Ekitri. Um, it, uh, we, uh, uh, when I intervened on Rona Mackay, she was of the view that this legislation wouldn't lead to more people who were charged with violent offences um, being um, given bail, but does the Cabinet Secretary think in relation to non-violent offences more accused are likely to get bail, and does he think that more people who potentially um, are a flight risk based on their history are likely to get bail, and has there been any modelling done that he is able to share with the Criminal Justice Committee on those issues? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 
can I say it's impossible to predict the future decisions of the court, but I would just go back to the focus of the bill, which is to refocus the use of remand. Now, I think it was said in the committee, and Katie Clark would have been there, and it might have been said by Jamie Green that he reckoned, and I'm sorry if I'm wrong on this, it can be uh, proven correct or otherwise by referring to the official report, that around 66% of the cases you had to have uh, remand for public safety or other reasons. That means there's over a third of cases where we don't have, if it's true, um, and I think it's a relatively reasonable observation to make, there's a third of cases where you don't have to have remand. But it's not possible, of course it's not possible, to protect what the decisions of the independent court system uh, will do in future. So I'm not able to make that uh, prediction. But just to say, if you look at the reasons for bringing this bill forward, they are to refocus the use of remand. And just to remind members, of course, the, de the deleterious effects of remand when, of course, somebody may not be guilty of the offence of which they're charged, but the impact it has on their family, the impact it has uh, on their job prospects, on their community. And also, of course, it's worth bearing in mind uh, that it costs nearly £40,000 a year to keep somebody in the prison service. And there's points made by Daniel Johnson and others about the fact that there are other disposals, and I understand the judiciary have to have faith in those disposals, and we have put more money into that, and we will put more money into that as well. But that is surely a better process. I, I see the member wants to intervene again, and uh, I'll be happy to do so. I appreciate Katie that he Clark. will be wanting to um, you know, get through his contribution. Um, but, but could you clarify then, um, is the government's intention that there should be a reduction in the number of people charged with non-violent offences who are remanded, and that there should be a reduction in the number of people who at the moment are considered a flight risk um, that, are, that are remanded. Is that the intention of the government? Because one of the things the committee has struggled with is actually understanding what the government's intentions are and what they're trying to achieve. Cabinet Secretary. I can only repeat what I said before to the member, that the government's intention is that remand should be used where it's most appropriate. And we shouldn't be using remand where it's not appropriate. Other members of all parties have given examples where they believe remand is inappropriate. We are trying to reduce the uh, cases when that happens. And on the point about uh, flight risk, or in other cases, potential victimisation of witnesses um, or, or victims, uh, of course we have to do, uh, make sure that we protect people from that. And beyond that, even things which might impact on this, the judicial system, such as intimidation of juries and others. So those are legitimate things, of course, when uh, remand should be, uh, uh, should be applied. And just uh, the issue of the, the definition of public safety. I'm more than happy to listen to any issues that people have have around that, but I have looked into this in some detail. There does not seem to be a great deal of doubt, going back to I think, Carol Malkin's point, what people think of the words public or safety. I am not sure where the doubt creeps in, and certainly some of the people involved in the process, whether it is lawyers or others, they seem quite um, you know, keen or uh, certainly uh, comforted by the idea that public safety will cover uh, the cases which are there. And if you want to go into prescribing it in law, it can often have uh, unintended consequences, which I'm sure many members wouldn't see. I'll give way to Daniel Johnson. I'm very Daniel grateful Johnson. to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I guess one of the distinctions that some people may wonder if the government is trying to draw is the difference between the, 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 the risk of somebody committing a further crime that doesn't include harm to another individual. Uh, so is that what the government's intention is? Is that it's actually only where there is a likelihood of, a, of, of harm being committed by the individual if they are uh, uh, bailed, uh, whereas if, the, if there's a risk of committing further crime, that that will, not, that will be reduced in terms of its consideration, uh, in terms of that decision whether to grow it, uh, bail or put a, 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 a person on remand? Thank you. And if you could draw your remarks to conclusion, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, yeah, just to say that I th somebody mentioned the example to me, not on the record, but uh, here just now, of somebody being put on demand for shoplifting, uh, for example, and usually um, uh, the case that's put forward is that of a woman. Um, and the point has been made by yourself and others, by the member and others, that we have too many women on remand. The proportion is even higher, even though women only comprise 4 per cent of the prison population. So it's trying to reduce uh, examples like this. But where there's a risk of violence to an individual, of course that's in the, the realms of public safety, as is the question of intimidation 
uh, of the jury. But if we leave those decisions to the court, albeit with the renewed focus that we have in terms of when remand should be used, then we can both make sure that public safety is looked after and, of course, that nobody is on remand that doesn't need to be. So, with that, I'm happy to propose uh, the general principles of the bill. I'm grateful to the Liberal Democrats and the Green Party and from the support from, that we heard from Maggie Chapman uh, for their support for that. And, of course, I'll continue to listen to and engage with both the committee and members across the chamber as we move forward to stage two. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on bail and release from Custody Scotland Bill at stage one. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 7755 on a financial resolution for the bail and release from Custody Scotland Bill. And I invite John Swinney to move the motion. It move forward, the President Officer. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion 8217 on legislative consent motion, procurement bill, UK legislation. And I call on Ivan McKee to speak to and move the motion. Uh, President Officer, uh, the motion for us would give consent to some provisions touching on devolved competence within the UK procurement bill, but not others. We have worked with the UK Government to agree a solution to some of the significant practical issues which the Bill might otherwise have caused. We have an agreement which will provide for continued cross-border cooperation on procurement exercises. And this is achieved by conferring delegated powers appropriately on UK and Scottish Ministers. However, we have not been able to reach agreement on powers in the Bill relating to the implementation of trade agreements. The Bill confers powers on UK Ministers, which would allow them to legislate in the devolved area of procurement to implement new agreements and to implement the outcome of trade disputes without the consent of Scottish Ministers. This is an unacceptable and disappointing attitude towards devolution and this Parliament, though perhaps not a surprising one, and so the motion does not indicate consent for those provisions. And I move the motion. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. And the next item of business is consideration of motion 8218 on legislative consent motion, Social Security, additional payments, number two bill, UK legislation. And I call on Ben McPherson to move the motion. Officer. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 8235 on approval of an SSI, and I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, and I call on Rhoda Grant. Can we have? Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, I wish to raise concerns about this SSI. Uh, there are in, unintended consequences with the legislation, and because of that, it is right to delay. But the delay means that unscrupulous people can still hide their interests in Scotland's land in companies registered in tax havens. We've already waited a long time for transparency on who they are. Therefore, I hope the government will act urgently to deal with these unintended consequences. It's, it's absurd that legislation that was designed to close tax loopholes and create transparency as to who the beneficial owners of land are, especially when that land is held in companies registered in tax ha havens, puts an unacceptable burden on Scottish churches. Religious groups are by their very nature own multiple buildings, churches, mosques and the like to allow their members to meet and worship. Each one of these buildings is clearly marked outside with contact details. They're not hidden. Less, it is less easy to identify other buildings such as manses and church halls, but they can be identified through the property registers in Scotland and a quick Google search will identify where to contact that church. Yet the Scottish Government are asking them to register each property under this legislation. For the Church of Scotland alone, that is close to 6,000 buildings, each needing three associates to be registered and around 20 notices. The estimated cost of this is £100,000 for the Church of Scotland. These organisations were never hidden, never used their assets as tax dodges and were wholly owned by their congregations. Therefore, the associates who require to be registered are not the beneficial owners, but simply office bearers representing their congregations. 
Scottish charitable and corporated organisations are governed under different legislation. Can I ask that churches and other similar religious buildings be treated along similar lines? Sadly, due to the Scottish Government's incompetence, what we are doing today is letting companies registered in Liechtenstein off the hook, allowing them to remain hidden and allowing them to misuse the privilege of owning Scotland's land. Surely this is not right. The Scottish Government must bring forward secondary legislation that catches those that this legislation was designed to capture while removing the burden of well-known associations such as Scottish charities and religious organisations. Thank you. And I call on Mary McAllen to respond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The register of controlling interest stems from the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 and the principal regulations establishing the register, they received unanimous cross-party support in the, this Parliament in 2021. Now, the intention of the RCI is to ensure that there can no longer be a category of owner or tenant where intentionally or otherwise control of decision making is obscured. And the 2021 regulations were a significant step forward in terms of the transparency sought. And I'm very pleased that the register is live. It went live on the 1st of April last year uh, as planned. Um, now, the principal regulations were subject to extensive consultation, including with religious organisations and parliamentary scrutiny. Indeed, we have uh, previously made amendments to the regulation in response to concerns raised by bodies such as the Church of Scotland. Um, despite this, in recent months, stakeholders have raised objections with me. These have been on the grounds of cost and administrative burden. Um, I should be clear, there is no cost to make a submission to the register per se. Uh, however, in practice, some in scope will instruct a solicitor, which obviously involves cost. Uh, moreover, whilst the, the registration process itself is relatively straightforward, preparation will be required. And where uh, you have a significant number of titles or a complex ownership structure, this will make the process more uh, complicated. But for those very reasons, it's important that these bodies remain within the scope of uh, the register. Um, I have had extensive uh, engagement. The Church of Scotland have been involved since 2016. It's very important to me that their views are heard. Yes, I certainly will. Rhoda Grant. Can, can I ask what the public interest is in having churches having to conform to this legislation? Minister. Yes, absolutely. And I, I don't know, I think it was Rhoda Grant herself who said that the Church of Scotland alone have some 6,000 titles uh, to land in Scotland which makes them, uh, I think, by some uh, way, the largest owner by number of titles in Scotland. So it's important to the integrity of a register, which is about the transparency of ownership, that the Church of Scotland should be involved in that. But as I say, the Church of Scotland first met with the First Minister in June last year, with my officials in August. I met with them in September. Um, I've written to them in November, December, January and most recently in February because ongoing engagement with the Church of Scotland was very important to me. Um, now I can't do as they have requested which was about taking them out with the scope of the register itself. However the SSI before the Parliament today responds to concerns by extending the period um, for registration before um, compliance terms come into play. This will ease the burden on those in scope allowing them to spread the administrative burden and uh, the cost. So I'm pleased that the lead committee has, has recommended uh, that these rec uh, regulations be approved. And I would just ask members who are considering voting against the extension to consider that this will mean charities, religious and third sector organisations who've made representations to me will be subject to criminal penalties from the 1st of April this year. So I would ask them to vote for the extension so that that can be put back to the following year and the administrative burden can be spread. Thank you. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. And the next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the parliamentary bureau motions, to move motions. On behalf of the parliamentary bureau, my apologies, at consideration of four parliamentary bureau motions. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the parliamentary bureau, to move motions 8236 to 8239. On Thank you, President Officer, and all moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. And there are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first is that motion 8220, in the name of Keith Brown, on bail and release from custody Scotland Bill at stage one, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting.